Good afternoon, everyone. Today we have the joy of gathering here with our priest council and the auxiliary bishops and, and all of you to inaugurate the new year of faith. I'm so grateful to have the priests, the presbyteral council here. These are the priests that give so much of their time to come together to advise and to help uh, make the policies for the archdiocese and the, the planning and, and their wise counsel is invaluable to me and to the whole archdiocese and I know it takes up so much of their time. We're very glad that our meeting today coincided with this great event so that we could uh, mark it together with them. Today we are united with Pope Benedict XVI and with all of our brothers and sisters all over the world as we come together to open this year of faith and to mark the 50 years uh, since the Second Vatican Council. Last year we actually had the 50th anniversary of Bishop McNaughton here in this chapel. Perhaps some of you were present. He's a Marinol bishop who was a bishop in Korea. And as a young bishop, he went to the Second Vatican Council. There are not many bishops alive today who were actually council fathers, but uh, Bishop McNaughton was one of them. And I believe he's gone back to Rome to be part of the celebration there with the Holy Father. But what most people don't realize that we have two quasi-council fathers with us in the persons of Monsignor Dennis Sheehan and Bishop Walter Edivain, who surreptitiously enterprising seminarians <laughs> snuck into the basilica and were there for the opening. And so I think that makes them at least quasi-council fathers. Today is also the feast of Blessed John the 23rd. Uh, usually a blessed or a saint's feast day is on the anniversary of his death. But when he was beatified, they decided to use this date, the opening of the council, as his feast day. And it is such a, uh, a wonderful tribute to him. It's amazing when you think that uh, two of the popes that were involved in the council have both been beatified. Blessed John the 23rd and Blessed John Paul the Second. And those of us who were alive at the time, and I was in the seminary, have such uh, affection for Blessed John the 23rd. And he, he was such an extraordinary human being, coming from a, a peasant family in northern Italy, having been a soldier in World War I. He served the Holy See in Turkey and Greece and the Middle East. And immediately after World War II, at a very difficult time, he was made the nuncio to France. And the Congress of Vienna has established in Europe that the nuncio is actually the head of the diplomatic corps, the dean of the diplomatic corps. And so you have the sort of anomalous situation where this holy bishop has to go to all of these parties and uh, cocktail receptions. And, uh, and there are many stories about his days as the dean of the diplomatic corps in Paris. They say that he was once at this banquet and across the table was a young lady who was dressed in a very abbreviated Parisian <laughs> outfit. And everybody was watching the nuncio to see what Blessed John the 23rd's reaction was going to be. And he realized that everyone was watching. And so there was a bowl of fruit in the middle of the table. And he reached out and picked up an apple and offered it to the young lady. He said, you know, it was only after Eve ate the apple that she realized she was naked. <laughs> He 
He was a great master of one-liners, and the most famous one, of course, is when the German ambassador asked him how many people work in the Vatican, and he said, oh, about half. <laughs> I was a seminarian at the time, and Cardinal O'Boyle, Bishop of Washington, went to the council. He took with him a Jesuit father, a Latinist from Georgetown University to help with the, with the translations. And at the opening of the council, the Cardinal recalls how there were 2,000 bishops from all over the world, 30 representatives of other faith groups, many laywomen, laymen, theologians, and the Holy Father enters the Basilica in a great procession, the Sistine Choir singing, and Holy Father arrives at the main altar and opens the Vatican Council in nomine patris et fili et spiritus sancti. And the Jesuit turned to Cardinal Boyle and said, that means in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Actually, the Blessed John's opening was in Latin, and it was a very moving presentation about the reasons for the Council and his hopes for the future. He talked about the 20 ecumenical councils that had been celebrated in the church, beginning with Nicaea in the year 325, which gave us the profession of faith that we pray every Sunday at Mass. In the Acts, there's actually a description of what many people considered the first council, the Council of Jerusalem, where the apostles came together at a time of crisis and decided that Gentiles could become Christians without first becoming Jews. And this was a very important moment in the history of the church. The Holy Father said that the greatest concern of the Second Vatican Council was that the sacred and central truths of our Christian faith should be guarded and taught more effectively. It wasn't about changing our doctrine, but embracing it more deeply and to better able articulate the doctrines of the church for this age. He called for a thoroughly pastoral approach to the presentation of our faith. The Holy Father said we must make use of the, mercy, the medicine of mercy Holy Father said, we meet the needs of the present day by demonstrating the validity of our teachings rather than by condemning others. The Catholic Church in this council desires to show herself as the loving mother of all, benign, patient, full of mercy and goodness toward all of those who are separated from her. The thrust of the council is toward establishing unity the unity that Christ desired so ardently. The Holy Father said, it's a triple sort of unity that we seek. First, unity among the Catholics that needs to be firm and strong. <laughs> unity of prayer and desire among those Christians that are separated from the Catholic Church. And thirdly, a unity of esteem and respect for those who follow non-Christian religions. The Holy Father also talks of the task of consolidating a path toward unity of humanity. Indeed, a week after the opening of the Council, the Council Father sent a message of the Second Vatican Council to the world, stating that the Church is not a stranger to people's earthly concerns, and that we are all called to be brothers and sisters and to be attentive to people's anxieties, their sorrows, their desires, and their hopes. The document calls for a call for peace, a commitment to social justice, and to bring the light of Christ to the world. The Council met 168 times over four years. Many important documents came out of the Council, 
the document on the liturgy that gave us the vernacular liturgy, the document on ecumenism, religious freedom, divine revelation, Christian education, and the church in the modern world are just a few. The effects of the Council have been very far-reaching. And to mark its 50th anniversary, our Holy Father, Pope Benedict XVI, has called for this year of faith and a synod on the new evangelization. The new evangelization means announcing the gospel again with a renewed enthusiasm, announcing it to people and countries that have been Christian, but perhaps where the faith has grown weak and people need to be reintroduced to the beauty of the gospel. Faith is not just the doctrines and truths that Christ has taught us, but faith is also a way of life and a web of relationships with God and with our brothers and sisters. And having the faith, being a disciple, means having a job to do, being part of the mission of Jesus, to build a civilization of love, to make God's kingdom present here in the world, to serve those in need, and to invite others to follow Christ in a life of discipleship in the Lord's church. The life of faith demands a personal conversion, striving to overcome selfishness and sin in our lives, to serve the material and the spiritual needs of others. We are called to feed the hungry, provide for widows and orphans, the sick and the imprisoned. But we're also care, called to care for the spiritual well-being of our brothers and sisters, to share with new generations the truths of the gospel, to help others to find that pearl of great price that is the faith, that will bring meaning and joy to their existence, and help them to find the path that leads to God, a path that leads us into the body of Christ, the church. <coughs> the readings for today are just the daily readings. We didn't choose special ones, but I think they're fantastic. The first reading begins with the words, you stupid Galatians. <laughs> Can you imagine how many phone calls and emails I would get if St. Paul had given this sermon in Boston? Well, he certainly is getting our attention. He's telling us that if we don't walk by faith and attentive to the Spirit, then we're pretty stupid. The wonderful parable in today's Gospel teaches us that faith and prayer are intimately connected. Jesus wants us to pray with the persistence of the man in the gospel who knocks on his neighbor's door until the man finally climbs out of bed and went down to give him what he was asking for. In the ancient world, as in places today where there's no electricity, everyone is asleep by midnight. In the parable, the man is waking up a neighbor to ask for three loaves of bread because someone has arrived at his house from a journey and he has nothing to offer. Hospitality is such a great obligation and this neighbor is determined to get those three loaves of bread, come hell or high water, rather than suffer the disgrace of not being able to feed his guest. The word the gospel uses is shameless to describe the relentless fashion that he refuses to take no for an answer. Jesus is saying, this is the way that we need to pray with this kind of insistence. It's like the honeymooners with Norton banging on the door in the middle of the night and Ralph crammed and roaring at him from inside. But because he's a friend, he's not afraid and he knows that in the end, he's going to get what he's asking for. These are the qualities that we must bring to prayer trust and perseverance. 
What father among you would hand his son a snake if he asked for a fish, or hand him a scorpion when he asked for an egg? And our Heavenly Father is even more loving and generous than the greatest dad in the world. And Jesus says, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus exhorts us to ask, to seek, to knock, and our Heavenly Father hears our prayer and gives us as our best friend the three loaves of bread and the Spirit. St. Luke's Gospel is sometimes called the Gospel of the Spirit, and it finds its continuation in the Acts of the Apostles that describes for us the first community of believers, the first Christians, the first parishes, the first dioceses. When I studied the book of Acts in the seminary, I was very impressed at the literary style of Luke and how well constructed it is. And he used all of the old uh, Greek literary forms and everything. But the surprising thing is that when you get to the book, it ends completely abruptly. One reason for that is I think that Luke is trying to show us that the Acts of the Apostles is not over, it continues. Now we are the protagonists of the act. And the Holy Spirit continues to guide us, the body of Christ, in our mission to carry on the work of Christ. During this year of faith, let us pray like the friend in the parable, banging on the door in the middle of the night, asking shamelessly, but trustingly knowing that our Heavenly Father is always there for us, who has given us life and faith, who has given us Christ and the bread of life in the Eucharist, will also give us the Spirit whenever we ask, seek, and knock. The year of faith must be a time of renewal of our life of prayer so that we might grow in our trust in God's love and so that we might ask the Spirit to enlighten us and to guide us during this year of faith. We want to deepen our own faith through prayer and the sacrament and the participation in the community of faith. We also want to learn more about our faith in the Vatican documents, the Catechism, and the New Apologetics. We want to share the treasure with others through the new evangelization, witnessing to our faith in Christ and inviting others to walk the path of discipleship with us. May Mary, the first disciple and woman of faith, help us to live our faith with joy and with courage, confident that the Father will give the Spirit to those who ask Him. God bless you.